First off, I want to apologize for all the food on my shirt. Uh, okay, uh, hello, my name is Oliver Young, and welcome to my Masterworks presentation. On my first day of IPS, I already heard about a project called Masterworks. I was just starting grade six, and I was already intimidated by the massive project, and I was amazed at the dedication you have to put into researching, essay writing, slideshow creating, and, <laughs> and presenting. I couldn't think of any ideas, so I decided to just put it off. After all, I thought I had four years until grade nine, tons of time, until all of a sudden I was in grade nine and I didn't know what I wanted to do. Ugh, sorry, I'm kind of stumbling. Um, I didn't have anything that necessarily interested me, and looking back on it, I was worried I, really, I wasn't really gonna find a topic to work on. Some of the previous years, grade nines, suggested to think about it over the summer, but of course, I managed to forget. And by September, the pressure was on. I thought it was gonna be easy to find a topic, but I was wrong, and the days went by and the stress piled until I finally found something. Food. <laughs> As you can see, I've always had a passion for food. I love food, so that's the only food I thought, and that's how my Masterworks was born. It was really hard finding what I wanted to do regarding food. There was so much to choose from, from cooking, eating, history, agriculture, and so much more. It was endless. And finally, after many ideas and changing of topics, I'd finally arrived at my topic for this Masterworks presentation. In this presentation, I will talk about food culture, what it is, what elements shaped its development in various parts of the world, and what it may look like in the future. To gain a deeper understanding of food culture, meet new people, and learn to cook new foods, I interviewed three people from different places around the world. Tomoko Kochi from Japan, Nardia Brown from Jamaica, and Mauricio Padilla Gomez from Mexico. And I'm sorry if I pronounced your last names wrong. Oh, wait, oh, sorry, I said Nardia Brown, right? So, okay, it's, <laughs> um, sharing this idea with Adrian, one of my advisors, he asked me, what is your culture? I didn't know. This was the first time I ever thought about my own culture. And then I went on to say, I don't have a culture, which is obviously not true. I left that meeting struggling to think about what my culture is and what foods are connected. Is part of my culture enjoying maple syrup and poutine? And how am I different or unique because of where I grew up and who I grew up with? Food culture is not just one simple definition. It can be quite different to everyone. That said, a good general way of looking at it is why do you eat the foods you do? To answer this question, we must look at the, most two, the two most significant factors to decide what we eat. What ingredients are available to you and what methods do you have to prepare it? To explain this, I, let's look at an example. My dad is from England and he loves beans on toast, <laughs> which is a very well-known English dish. Therefore, as a kid, and even now, my dad likes to make beans on toast for me, and this is one of my favorite things to eat. Beans on toast were ingredients many English people had access to. It's cheap, simple to prepare, and canned beans last a very long time. Not to mention, it's also a yummy snack. Climate and geography also play a fundamental role in deciding what makes it to your dinner table. The ingredients for beans on toast grow relatively easy in the British climate, and I don't see people in London growing mangoes from the Caribbean or eating rice from Asia. They grew and ate what they could, hence beans on toast. This method to cook beans on toast, uh, this method to cook beans on toast is also very simple. Baking bread is a common place in England, and canned beans were introduced to London in 1886 by the Heinz Company in the early 20th century. Canned beans proved a huge hit in the UK market. Most of the English population had stoves in their houses and thus make baking bread and warming up a can of beans was an easy job for just about anyone. Uh, uh, food culture is shaped over many years, and the example of beans on toast is barely scratching the surface. The fact is that food culture is always changing and will continue to change, but the fundamentals of why we eat what we do remain the same. What we eat, as I mentioned before, is all about what's available. After all, you can't eat what you don't have. Ingredients, therefore, are the foundation of food, cul food culture. Traditionally, food choices were based on what was accessible, what could be grown, collected, or hunted in your geographic location. Oh, sorry. <laughs> While now we have access to almost any food we desire, climate and geography historically formed our food culture as they determine what grows where. Prior to the Second World War, it was most common to eat foods that grew locally and in season. Availability of food and what could be grown caught or harvested was the most important factor in f forming the food culture of a place and people. If we look back on my beans and toast example, 
Beans grow readily in the Engli readily in the English climate, as do grains to make bread. Other common foods like fish and chips also near this idea. As England is an island, fish always fish was always an important element of English food culture. Jamaica is also an island. Jamaica is also an island nation. The national dish is ackee and saltfish, which has been around for a very long time. Ackee, which is a fruit that grows prolifically in the Jamaican climate, and it's so important that in fact the ackee fruit it, in Jamaica is honored as the national fruit, while fish can be easily caught, creating a dish that is not only yummy, but always available. The climate in Mexico allows lots of fruits and vegetables to grow year-round. Thus, many foods are readily available, including tomatoes, avocados, limes, lemons, chili peppers, corn, and much more. You may be thinking, aren't those the ingredients to a taco, burrito, or quesadilla? Indeed they are, demonstrating the strong the strong connection between availability of ingredients and food culture. Japan has meals like this too. Because Japan has an abundant amount of rain, most rice is grown through the process of wet cultivation. Wet cultivation or the paddy fields are a staple across Japan, demonstrating the, demonstrating the wide, wide availability of rice. Grains like rice and others are used in Japan's traditional dishes like sticky rice pudding, sushi, and much more. While climate and geography have traditionally formed what we eat, one of humanity's hardest challenges was the decay of food that we caught, grew, killed, and collected. The necessity of preserving our food has played another significant role in the development of food culture. The need to, the need to preserve food has led to a large variety of inter interesting cuisine, such as pickled, salted, and dried foods. Returning to the traditional Jamaican meal of ackee and saltfish, the salt was used to preserve the fish, and the salt dries out the fish to keep it from spoiling. According to Wikipedia, the drying of food is the world's oldest known preservation method, and dried fish has a storage life of several years. An added bonus is that the salt adds flavor to the fish, creating a distinct flavor combination so loved in Jamaica. While I was cooking with Tomoko, we used dried fish flakes to flavor the miso soup that we made. Traditionally, in Japanese cooking, whole dried fish is flaked with a special tool called a dried bonito flake shaver. This looks like a wooden box with a blade, and the dried fish is great against the blade, and the flakes collect in the box below. You can see it in the middle photo right there. Pickling is another common preservation method. While pickling, well, while pickling is a common preservation method worldwide, pickled vegetables are an important part of the traditional Japanese diet. Pickles first appeared way back in Japanese history in the days before refrigeration. When pickles, oh sorry, and as a result, some traditionally prepared types of pickles can be, can be kept practically indefinitely, and the different methods used to make suke mono, or Japanese pickles, vary from simple salting and vinegar brining to more complicated processes involving cultured molds and fermentation. An example of Japanese pickling could be the use of soy sauce, or in Japanese, shoyuzuke. Shoyuzuke uses a soy sauce base with other pickling ingredients to make a unique flavor and texture that other methods of pickling do not have not to mention the golden brown color that is created on the pickle or other vegetable's surface. Tomoko and I also worked with a common traditional fermented food, miso. Miso is produced by fermenting soybeans with salt, koji, and sometimes rice, barley, seaweed, and other ingredients. The result is a thick paste used for sauces, spreads, pickling vegetables, fish, meats, and mixing with dashi soup stock to serve as miso soup, a Japanese culinary staple. This indigenous method of preserving soybeans <laughs> creates a very delicious food. The ingredients that Tomoko and I used to make miso soup consisted of dashi stock, tofu, bonito flakes, seaweed, and water. After gathering all these ingredients, we started making the miso soup. Making the miso soup was a very interesting experience, and after boiling the water, cutting the tofu, and adding the dashi stock, something that we did was very fun. Tomoko and I got to shred the bonito flakes into <laughs> to shred dried bonito flakes to add a stronger umami flavor to the miso. The fish itself looks like wood and is rather unappetizing, but don't worry, after leaving the dried fi fish flakes to sit and to give the miso flavor, we removed the flakes from the soup and we added some dried seaweed and it was ready to eat. While discussing necessity and preservation for food in Mexico with Mauricio, he explained that because of the, because of the climate, fresh food is rarely available year round eliminating the need to preserve and store foods for long periods of time. Thus, preserved foods are traditionally rare in Mexican food culture. Another aspect of food culture is how we eat. 
Are we loud, quiet, do we with our hands or with utensils? Are large groups encouraged or better to eat alone with a smaller number? Nardi from Jamaica and Marisha from Mexico talked a lot about how important food culture was to their family as a way of coming together and showing love. They said they were often loud and there was more food than needed. On the other hand, when I was with Tomoko from Japan, I noticed that we ate more quietly and formally at the table. Tomoko also taught me that a, lot, a lot about how food culture is connected to etiquette. For example, in Japan, slipping your noodles is considered polite, whereas this is considered rude here. In Japan, you eat four to five small dishes with each meal, whereas in Canada, you tend to have one large plate. An already from Jamaica let me know that food is often considered a gift at special occasions. Instead of bringing presents to a gathering, you might bring food. These are all little things that make big changes in how we eat, and can just be the difference between chopsticks and forks that changes your food culture. How we prepare our food has been fundamentally formed by where we live and what cooking methods are available to us. Thus, this significantly shapes our food culture. An example of this could be something that Mauricio explained to me during my interview with him. He explained to me that he uses fire a lot as a core method of cooking. Mauricio said that he cooked a lot of food uses, that uses fire. He uses it for almost everything. He told me that he used to cook on open fires all the time and it would give a nice texture and flavor that a stove cannot accomplish. He said that the reason for an open fire is because he didn't have a stove. For Mauricio, having a stove was a luxury he didn't have access to. Now he lives in Vancouver, he uses a stove, and he said that he doesn't give it the same texture that he, loved, that he so loved when he was in Mexico. A common cooking method in Jamaica is to cook foods over a long period of time. For instance, oh, sorry. For instance, many broth, soups, and meat dishes can take hours to cook. Some can even be simmered for a period of days to reach the desired result. Nari explained to me that cooking in broths is a common method in Jamaica, and that she would often start cooking days before a gathering. An example of this could be when we were cooking ackee and saltfish. She left the saltfish in a broth for a long time to collect flavor and texture, making it taste very good. Our Western food culture, while still connecting to our traditional roots, looked very different than it did in the early 20th century. During the Industrial Revolution from 1740 to 1840, Western society's food culture has started to change. After the Second World War, the heavy influence of necessity and availability that traditionally shaped our food culture soon became things of the past. The growth of rapid transportation and the development of refrigerated shipping allowed people to have a ready access to a stunning variety of foods. Today, you can eat mangoes in the winter and eat foods from all over whenever you want. Fridges and supermarkets have also replaced the need for preservation and storage of food over the winter. Despite this truly incredible network of trade that's given us so much access to different foods. The cooks I interviewed often laminate the inability to get some of the ingredients they grew up with. Nardia said that she doesn't cook as many traditional Jamaican meals because she can't find the right ingredients. For instance, while you can, pur while you can purchase canned ackee here in Vancouver, she found, that it was, she found that the canned fruit is a poor replacement for fresh grown ackee. Tomoko has, ha has had to adapt the ingredients in her miso soup a little to fit what she can buy at stores and what tastes best. Mauricio explained that it's hard, hard to source certain parts of the animals that he would commonly eat in Mexico. For instance, the head and organ meats are often overlooked in Western food culture. The increase in availability of ingredients and the easy storage of food has not always meant that there has been a corresponding increase in the quality of food. While many people resist this aspect of food culture, fast, cheap food is a commonplace here. So what should the future of food culture look like? All of the people I talked to in my interviews said they saw fusion dishes becoming more common, mirroring the growing integration and mix of cultures in our communities. As our communities, cities, and countries are becoming more and more diverse, diverse food cultures and the fusion of traditional dishes is sure to follow. While we are already seeing the growth of fusion dishes in, and more and more mixed cultures in our communities, but let's explore a few more ideas. Oh, sorry. We are already seeing the growth of fusion dishes in more and more mixed cultures in our communities. But let's explore a few more ideas. One idea is that food culture will likely take a full reset in regards to climate change. Our change in climate will likely have a powerful influence on what foods we have access to. I think we will see more environmentally friendly food, such as more vegetarian and vegan options widely available. Also, I expect to see the development of new food culture focused entirely on fusion. After my interviews and cooking with wonderful chefs from three distinctly different cultural backgrounds, I was inspired to try cooking more myself. I wanted to make a fusion dish that decided, and I decided on making a Jamaican dumpling with Mexican toppings. I served this for my family and we enjoyed talking and discussing food from around the world 
although I, I burnt the dumpling a little bit. <laughs> I am excited about the future of food culture. In the TV program, The History of Food, I watched food being grown inside large vertical farming warehouses, fed with artificial lights. This was to increase the amount of, lo of local fresh produce and not to be dependent on the sun for, lo for long travel routes for fresh produce. This same program talked about eating bugs as a future source of protein, as they can be grown in large quantities in small spaces with little resources. I'm not sure I'm interested in eating bugs, but you never know. So, so after hearing all that, who here would like to eat bugs for the next meal? <laughs> okay, that's a lot more than I expected. <laughs> we are already seeing the change in food culture as more and more fusion restaurants are opening in major cities. The need, the need to pay attention to our food and on our climate is also becoming part of our food culture. For instance, Phil Day, one of my advisors, started a restaurant called Scratch Kitchen. He now champions the development of sustainable food systems where attention is paid to the entirety of the process, from the soil all the way to the plate. This growing attention is not just to the food itself, but the conditions in which it's produced and transported. This will surely have a very positive impact on the future of our food culture. In this essay, I talked. <laughs> in this essay, I talked about food culture, what it is, what elements shape its development in various parts of the world, and what it may look like in the future. This was my thesis, and I did accomplish all this, but it turned into so much more. After interviewing three people from around the world, I learned from their personal stories about how important food culture really is. By asking them about their food culture, I learned about their childhood, their traditions, their families, their celebrations, and their love for food. To conclude, one of the best parts of this project was getting a chance to spend a day cooking, talking, laughing, and learning with each person. Nardi from Jamaica, Tomoko in Japan, and Mauricio from Mexico. These experiences have changed me in a good way, and I'm so thankful and grateful for you guys to take time out of your day to, in to let me interview you. My interviews helped me clarify what food culture is, confirm that availability and necessity of storing food has been the traditional foundation of what forms food culture throughout the world and how immigration, availability, and fusion is a big part of the future of food culture. Beyond this, beyond this learning, my personal experience talking about food culture was educational. For example, Nardia helped me, from Jamaica helped me learn that food is a way to bring people together. It's important to always cook and eat with others. As I spent my time with her, I got to talk to her sons, her partner, and by the end of the four-hour experience, I felt like I had made new friends, all because we cooked and ate a meal together. Nardia has helped me discover different products and tastes that I had never seen or tried before. She also showed me a different way to cook and combine ingredients. Tomoko from Japan really influenced my understanding of how once you move from one country to another, your relationship to your food culture changes. For example, she used to eat on low tables and have many dishes, but now that, but now that she's moved to Canada, she's had to adapt. <laughs> Sorry, I'm gonna have some water. <laughs> Tomoko also remind me, reminded me how food culture is connected to our ancestors and especially our parents. As I mentioned, I love my dad's beans on toast, and Tomoko still tries to cook her miso soup just like her mom's. My afternoon with Mauricio from Mexico taught me that food culture can include both traditional dishes and current preferences. For example, he tries to live a healthy lifestyle and therefore he substitutes some traditional ingredients for healthier choices while still holding on to the authentic Mexican style. These ingredients confirm my research on why traditional foods in different cultures, why traditional foods are in different cultures. But beyond this, I learned that culture is not stagnant. It's always changing and being influenced by a variety of factors. Major events in the world have influ influenced food culture, and even with these three people I interviewed, their personal lives have influenced their food culture as well. I feel I've taken my knowledge and understanding of others' food culture to a new and improved level for myself. It has helped me understand not only food, but people from different cultures as well. This topic has opened my eyes, sorry, excuse me, I just, the water. Uh, this topic has opened my eyes to, uh, to various ideas about food. For example, I love miso soup, but when I tried Tomoko's miso soup and the way she prepares it in Japan, I was blown away. It was the best miso soup I ever had. I would assumed all miso soup was the same, but I was happily proven wrong. I would assumed cooking as a little kid was dangerous and not a good idea. However, Mauricio taught me that at a young age, 
Co cooking on open fire has significantly positive impact on his life. He is now a chef, and he credits his experience as a child to his career choice. Another example that I assumed kids would be sad if they didn't get Christmas gifts. However, Nardia told me that in Jamaican culture, when she grew up, they didn't have Santa. Their gifts were food, and they ate, and they always felt very happy. I've also discovered how difficult it would be to move to a different country without your food. Nardia told me that when she first moved here, she ate macaroni and cheese and other easy foods for months as she struggled to cook without the ingredients she was used to. Tomoko felt this way as well. She did not find the same ingredients she was accustomed to. I wonder what this experience would be like. Hearing Tomoko, Nardia, and Mauricio's stories, I feel I have a better understanding of food culture. And in the future, I hope to use my knowledge of what I've researched in food culture to expand my cooking ability and to understand people's culture even more. I've learned that learning about one's, one's culture and the way they eat is not only a good thing to understand, but can help form relationships and further communication. The next thing I would like to do with this knowledge would be to explore more varieties of cuisine for myself. I think this will help me start to like more and more diverse food choices. I'd love to educate others about the importance of food culture. I would love to help everyone appreciate food culture as I believe this will help everyone come together as a society. And in the future, I'd love to travel and expand on what I've started. Overall, I would like to learn more, understand more, and most importantly, eat more. Uh, it's finally over. <sighs> uh, no, it's not. Okay, um... First of all, I want to thank my parents who, and I'm talking about you, Mom, may have had our indecisive moments and disagreements, but in the end, we always made up and we always made my master a little bit better than it was before. Thank you so much. I also want to thank my external advisor, Phil Day. Although we didn't meet that much, it was worth every minute of our meeting, and I had a great time learning about how to interview people and your information on these topics. Now, talking about interviewing people, I couldn't have done it without you guys. Seriously, I wouldn't have a masterworks if you guys didn't agree to take time out of your day to let me interview you guys. I, I love my place. <sighs> um, if, if you put, take time out of your day to put up with my many questions and nervous stutter. I've had, so much time, I've had so much fun learning, listening, cooking, and most importantly, eating with all three of you. I also want to especially thank Nardi and Mauricio for coming to my presentation. I, I hope it was good. Um, Adrian, Adrian. Adrian, <laughs> where to begin, or should I say, where to end? I put this in all caps. Thank you so much, Adrian. <laughs> I can't believe a human can put up with how many times I've wanted to meet, ask you questions, or edit my essay. It's truly been an honor to be your student and hopefully your friend for these past four years. Uh, why do I lose my spot on the most important part of the whole essay? <laughs> I also want to finally thank Jen for organizing this amazing Masterworks program for everybody. Uh, and this is super annoying grade nine class. I can't believe you didn't lose your mind with how many times I screamed out a question without raising my hand. I've really had so much fun. I'm really gonna miss you all at IPS, but definitely not the commute. Thank you guys so much. It's not over yet, Mr. Young. <laughs> Go on. So, that was an excellent presentation, Mr. Young. And I'm so pleased that you brought your fan club here and that um, we really got into the uh, process of what you uh, were trying to come up with. So food culture can be dry. You certainly made it very exciting and brought everybody's personal opinions in there. It was amazing. Yeah. And well done on your presentation. Thank you, thank you. So we are going to turn it over to questions from the advisors first. So to you, Adrian. And I'm sure you have a message from Phil, who is joining us online. Thank you, Phil. And mom, dad, and advisors, if you have any questions, you get to have the next in line. Uh, well done, Oliver. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Young, 
Uh, it was an incredible process working with you from a very vague idea yeah. to an extremely well-researched, well-polished, and eloquently presented yeah. presentation. Thank you, thank you. Um, what you told us about food culture, the, where it came from, its history, where it could be going, uh, was detailed, in-depth, uh, fascinating. Um, but didn't cover a huge part of your thoughts, yeah. which was that you also, which could be a whole new masterworks, learned how to interview people, uh, cook with them, ask them questions, pull out a story, and then put that also. Yeah. You kind of did two masterworks. I wrote my whole thing, and I guess I didn't have enough about them, so you I'm added sorry about that. There was a lot. I just wanted to draw attention to that because it's truly miraculous. Well, yeah. um, so I guess I'll ask Phil's question first. Yeah. Um, he's really sorry he can't be here. Unfortunately, he has a job <laughs> and he doesn't work here, so sucker. <laughs> uh, he asks you really. We talked about you talked a lot about food diversity. So, what is the value of food diversity? Why not just eat the same thing? Over? Well, uh, I mentioned this in my essay, but uh, one, it's just awesome to like expand your palate, like to be able to eat more things. And also, there's a lot of really yummy foods out there that are just amazing. Like I enjoyed every single thing we cooked. It, it was awesome. Thank you guys. Um, also, it's it's a if you go and explore other like food diversity, it's it's awesome. You can learn about people's like food culture. It'll help you learn more about different people. So I think that's a big plus. And uh, yeah, just eating a like very big like different diet, and also you can maybe become more flexible to like uh, climate change friendly foods if you try more stuff and explore food diversity. So I think that's the importance of food diversity. Great answer. Great answer. So I have uh, three questions for you that really tied on to your interview process mainly. I mean, the first two are a little easier than the last one perhaps, but uh, what was your favorite part of the interview process and why was that your favorite? Uh, I'm gonna say this, it's kind of obvious. You're probably gonna guess what I'm gonna say, but my absolute favorite part of the interview process was eating food that we cooked. <laughs> um, but of course, since that's since that's a little bit obvious, I think it was really cool to learn about like the similarities in like people's food culture. Like every single thing that we cooked used like heat and fire, but I don't think a single thing we cooked had the, a single of the same ingredients in it. So I think that was really cool, except for maybe like seasoning. Right. So I think that was really cool to look at and compare those. That was my favorite part about the interview process. Uh, so on top of that, what was then the most challenging part? Uh, the most challenging part for me is probably creating the questions and like I was really nervous like I've never interviewed anyone before so going into them and not knowing what to expect was probably the hardest part for me and yeah, I was creating interview questions because I didn't really know what I wanted to say and I wasn't sure if what I was asking was clear or and it was just kind of trial and error for me. Um, so yeah, that was, the, that was the hardest part. And also, but like, something that was really good about that is it was really hard like going into it, but then also like once you kind of start going, like as I mentioned, like it was really nice to learn about various nice people. And I feel like by the end, and like very soon and I feel like by the end we were kind of like, like talking as if we were friends and stuff. Like, so I feel like that's a really big plus. I think that you had that process that starting it was difficult and at the end you felt connected to the person you're interviewing it says a lot about you um, why i think you included interviews in your masterworks is i think you have an incredible skill talking to people did i go too fast no <laughs> so my final question is then what qualities do you think make a good interviewer? Um, I think something that I lacked, but is definitely really good in it, someone who's interviewing someone else is like, is confidence. Because if you're going into an interview and you're like, oh, hi, hi, <laughs> and, like it's, it's not gonna be as good, you might, it's just not that, it's just, I don't know how to explain it, but just being confident and like making sure 
you get your questions out clearly. Like if you're talking to somebody, asking a question, make sure it's clear, and also like make sure your questions are clear because if they're not, they might give you an answer that you don't want, or if they might be trying to answer and your question is all over the place, or and they, even if they give you an answer and your question isn't clear, you might not. That's not might not be the answer you want. So mm -hmm. that's a big plus. And also uh, being a good listener, because interviewing someone, like when you're interviewing someone, you want them to do the talking, so if you're really talkative, try listening for once. <laughs> <laughs> Great answer. Well done. Thank, Thank you, Adrian. Thank you so much. Okay, we're now going to open up to questions from the floor, unless you guys would like to say anything. Are you going to wait on that one? <laughs> okay, so there's a huge lineup of students who want to ask oh. Like from the interviews or just in general? In in general? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. It, I have an answer for you. It was actually. I, I, uh, I want to say my favorite food of all time is probably tacos because I love tacos. Yeah. But but like. Like me and Lucy, we cook tacos, but I also don't want to put down anything else that we cooked because every, everything was really good. So I'm just saying that. But yeah, just me and my dad, we go to a taco restaurant a lot, and I really like it there. And that's probably my favorite food, tacos, yeah. Uh, so first of all, very good job, Mr. Young. Thank My you. question is, what was your favorite part uh, of doing the presentation? Like, uh, the presentation? Yeah. Uh, nothing. <laughs> uh, if I had to pick, my favorite part of the presentation was the part where I'm at the end. <laughs> so, yeah. Amazing job, Mr. Young. I will say it's been an honor thank being you, your classmate you. this past four yeah, years. Yeah, me too. Um, now that you've tried foods from Jamaica and Japan and Mexico, what country do you think you want to try foods from next? Um, uh, Max is kind of influencing my answer. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I really thought like Indian food culture would be really cool to explore. I always wanted to go to India and like try out like food stands and stuff. Um, but I, I already I have tried a lot of stuff here that's from like the in Indian, but uh, probably I had to pick one more. Probably Indian. I really want to try that. I really want to go there, try that, and that'd be really cool. So. Great presentation, Mr. Young. Thank you, Max. Uh, what is your opinion of our modern food culture, or like more developed countries? Like what's the upside, what's the downside? Of our modern food culture? Yeah. Um, I think a big downside is, one of the down, biggest downsides of modern food culture is fast food. I know it's really yummy, but uh, it, it has a really, like, not that great positive, uh, not that great impact on our environment. I didn't look too much into, into the environmental impacts, but I did look at it, so I know that there is, isn't a great, uh, effect and the upside is I think that there's so much like with like like our new technology and stuff like trucks and like things that can like transport food everywhere I think that it's really cool because it's like it's not like oh uh, we have a garden in the back and that's all we eat it's like you can go to the supermarket and get whatever you want so I think that's a really cool uh, plus side. Um, first of all I'd say great presentation very cool Thank you. see all the cool uh, food. Um, did you, uh, I have two questions. Did you uh, memorize any of like the recipes that you used? In the any of the recipes? No, <laughs> but my mom was begging me to bring this up, so I will. <laughs> I, uh, I did make a cookbook of a few of the recipes that I remembered. Yeah. It's pretty short. But I 
Yeah, so that was pretty cool, and I added some recipes that weren't that weren't part of my interviews because it was it's kind of short because we cooked like three or four things. So, but yeah, I made a cookbook about that, so that was pretty cool. And, but I don't remember. I don't have them memorized now. That's very cool. Uh, my second question is, which one was like your favorite to make? Favorite to make. Um, I wanna I wanna say this again that everyone's was good. <laughs> Uh, I think something that was really cool is, um, I don't know, I mean one thing that I didn't mention in my interviews is that when I was with Tomoko, she's not here, which is too bad, but um, uh, we cooked, well she had, she cooked some uh, like squid balls or something, I don't know what they were called, <laughs> but um, but they were like, it's like a little like a squid and then like wrapped in like dough and then you put like some sauce on it and that was really cool. So, I, and she explained to me how she made that. I didn't make that with her, but that was um, something that she explained to me and how to make it and I thought that was really cool. So yeah, I remember when, in, when you were in grade seven and for a design class you did a world foods um, project and I remember thinking I hit on the most popular uh, project ever because everybody in the whole class loved it so much. Yeah. What do you think? So I have two questions. Wait, what, what do you I think do it project? is about? <laughs> what? What did I do for that? You don't uh, I don't remember. <laughs> but remember, your class had foods from Italy and China and India all over the world, and we had this massive hot oh, lunch. Oh, yeah. oh, we did India. I made mango lassi. Yeah, yeah. that was right. so good. And I felt really guilty because all the parents had to support bringing all these amazing foods. <laughs> Oh, but that it was, thing. Yeah, it that was, was really, really cool. popular, and I remember one of the things was obviously the eating that everybody enjoyed, but it was also, I was really impressed by how people presented about the countries. Um, so do you feel like through this, just the, you didn't, you didn't research specifically the history of the countries or anything, but do you feel like through this process you learn more about not just the culture, but the place that, that people uh, are from? I think so. I, I hope so. Um, uh, yeah, wait, can you ask that again? Just well, so somebody's yeah. culture and what they eat and, and stuff is is one thing, but the country that the, those foods originate from, like say the geography and the environment and the yeah. economy, all those things that you guys dug up when you were learning about. Um, I'm not sure this answers your question, but I, uh, not that much. I mainly focused on like what affects food culture. I didn't really focus too much on like like kind of like the ge geography and stuff, but I didn't mention that like geography does play like a big role in food culture. Like it, it did because like you like in Japan like rice fields and stuff and like like big like crops and stuff. So like that's pretty cool. I learned about that. And but it wasn't really anything that I didn't already know. So I'm not sure if that answers your question. Oh, okay, I was thinking also about celebrations like you know holidays and oh yeah and just. Celebrations I thought, and things. I thought it was really cool that yeah. they didn't have Santa. Right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then my other question is that you go traveling to these countries and you're meeting people and eating with them and they say, what is the food culture of Canada? What would you say? Um, uh, I mean, I love poutine. Uh, in fact, recently I had like, like poutine, but it had like butter chicken on top and so that was really good. Um, so, well, it's the Canadian food culture. See, this is kind of this kind of what I was talking about. Like, when Adrian asked me, like, what is your food culture? I, d I don't really know because, like, I've kind of been here my whole life. Um, I want to say, like, maple syrup. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Actually, I want to answer that question better for you. I feel like I didn't really answer it that well. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I never really. I didn't spend too much time thinking about my own. Do you want to help me out, Jen? What do you think oh. our food culture? Well, I think you actually said a lot of it in your yeah. essay that in Canada there's a lot of fusion, yeah. and that you go back to your heritage and produce beans on toast. Yeah, that was pretty cool. <laughs> so. Okay, uh, thanks, man. Holly, um, why did you pick um, those three cultures to do? Um, why well, did pick those three topics? Um, mainly because I had people to interview from those three places. And because like my mom uh, knew all the people or like had connections to all of them, so she was a really big help in organizing that. Um, 
and also, uh, I don't know, I mean, I would have, my mom kept pestering me about doing more and more, more and more interviews. Um, why did I make those three? Mainly because, it, like, it was easy and I was interested in them, I was interested in them. I feel like everyone has eaten something from, like, Japan and Mexico and, and, like, a, uh, Jamaica. I feel like everyone has pretty much eaten, like, at least, you've probably eaten at least one food from those countries. So I feel like it's kind of like something that, that people can relate to, is if I did something from like, I don't know, yeah, I didn't even attempt to pronounce that, but yeah, it's, it, uh, yeah. so I just think that people relate to it, and also because I have people that interview from those places. Mr. Young, that was really good, that Thank was, you. like, if not my, it was a very good topic, that was my favorite topic. Thank you, thank um, you, much appreciated. Uh, I was wondering, would you consider like making your own dish, like using fusion, like making yeah. your own? I I did I did try that. I would attempt it again because I burnt it really <laughs> bad, uh, and like I set the smoke alarm off because everything <laughs> and everything because I'm not that good of a cook. But um, I definitely will try it again. I definitely want to try it with different cultures as well. Like I thought that like. Um, Sushi pizza would be cool. <laughs> I think that's already been done. So, but yeah, I just yeah, I definitely want to try that. And I don't know what I do yet, but I yeah, definitely. And only one more question. Yeah. I forgot the rest. But um. The rest. <laughs> <laughs> um. I forgot that one too. Never yes. mind. <laughs> Also want to say very good job for today. Thank you. Great presentation. Um, I was wondering why why did you choose this topic? Why I chose this topic? Um uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, by September the pressure was on and I thought <laughs> Mainly because I didn't know what I wanted to do and I wanted to do something that was unique. Like I didn't want it to be like something like no offense scaling, I didn't want it to be like something that people have already done, like entrepreneurship or something. So uh, no offense, it was great, Caitlin. But uh, I wanted to do something that was unique and also I didn't have a topic, mainly because I, I didn't have a topic and it was like yeah, so it was, it was been I was running out of time to get a topic and Adrian and Jem were on my tail, so. <laughs> Oliver, just so you know, food has been done many times. No! <laughs> <laughs> Not in the way that you present. Oh, okay. Wait, actually, yep. yeah. we had topics. We had cookbooks, we had all sorts of things. Oh, I didn't look back, so I just thought that it was okay. Something. It's all good. I was wondering if you were to do it again, not change what you already did, but do it again, what would you do differently if you were to do something? Um, Probably interview more people, because I feel like the more people I interview, the longer and better and the more information that you get. And also, it's really fun, and I get to eat more food when you interview more people. Um, thank you, thank you. I, I hope it wasn't too monotone for you guys. Um, yeah, if I had to do it again, I'd probably just start doing everything earlier, because because I was really big at procrastinating. This goes out to grade eight, seven, and sixes. Don't procrastinate, I'm telling you. It'll, yeah. it'll bite you in your butt. It's really not good. Um, yeah, so I, I wrote, like, yeah, so I didn't even have a topic for like, the first two months of school, and then, yeah, so just, I probably just try and do everything earlier so I had more time to take it slow and put more detail into everything. Excellent presentation, Mr. Young. Thank you. Wonder, with all the different ways of preparing food, what do you think would be your favorite method to cook food? Like, what do you like, mean? You mean from example? pan frying it, boiling it, cooking it in the oven, grilling it? Um, I don't know. Could I? Uh, oh, I've never really thought about that. Um, boiling. Uh, I don't know. Um, maybe. Hey mom, what's your favorite? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have to start just sharing the questions around? <laughs> Seriously. Barbecue. Okay, my favorite thing is um, barbecue. Full of doors. Excellent presentation, Mr. Young. Thank you, Hayden. 
Um, what influenced you to pick the uh, food cultures you did, like Japanese, um, Mexican, and um, mainly because I think this part, we already asked this question. Oh my! I can answer it again if you want. Sure. Okay. Um, I picked you know, it. You've got lots of questions, so. It was influenced by the people that his mom knew. No, you're next in the case. What are your thoughts on German cuisine? What are my thoughts on German cuisine? Um, good. Yeah, it's it's great. Professor Young, congratulations on your paper. Thank you. You get A plus for nervousness. <laughs> Thank and, you. And uh, I love your fashion statement. I do detect, however, a bit of a bottleneck. Yeah. Yeah. Like, there's no button right here. I didn't notice until I bought it. So it's kind of like. So I noticed the photographs you presented of the three uh, different meals that you prepared with your lovely mentors didn't have dessert. I don't remember seeing anything sweet except for perhaps the fruit that was in the uh, West Indian dish. So do those three cultures not serve or like sweets per se? Um, that's a great question. I, uh, we did, I didn't show how to photo, but when I was with Nardia, we did eat some, what was it called again? Rum cake, because that's big in Jamaica. I heard that like during Halloween people were like, no, no. Oh, not Halloween? Oh, you don't do Halloween, sorry. Sorry, some, what, what event was it? Oh, Christmas, Christmas, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, yeah, during Christmas, like, people eat rum cake a lot, which is a big thing in Jamaica, so. Sorry if I got something wrong in the no, presentation. Um, but yeah, so that's a big thing. I just didn't show it, because I don't, I don't, did you make it? The, the rum cake? Yeah. No. Yeah, um, yeah, and it was more a thing after, like, it was, I didn't show it, but I, each thing I does have the desserts. I didn't really look into the desserts as much. And we have fun. Oh, sorry, no, we just have rum cake. Oh, oh, yeah, so rum cake's a big one in Jamaica, and Mauricio's are one for Mexico. Oh, sorry. Well, we'll have a lot of desserts, but I don't usually cook desserts. Yeah. yeah. So it was more just something that wasn't really happening. It's not that they, they don't exist or anything. Uh, have you do the last question? Um, great job, yeah. Um, my question is, do you think that like food culture or like where we're from is like uh, determines whether we don't like certain foods as well, like as well as liking them? Like you said something about how like people here don't use all the animal or the meat or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wait, sorry, say that again. So like, is, do you think that like food culture determines whether people don't like certain foods? Oh, um, oh, you're saying food culture, like, it's a nice thing. Oh, I don't think so, because, like, I think, uh, I don't think it really applies to, like, a whole, kind of, like, like, everybody in Mexico, like, I'm sure some people in Mexico, um, don't like tacos or something, but, like, but I just mean, like, I don't think, I didn't really look into that, but I don't think that, Disliking foods applies. Maybe actually that could be something. I actually I actually don't know. Um, Cause I just I just feel like like here like my brother might not like poutine or something or Lucas Legal, but. <laughs> but like uh, but then like but then again, just because he doesn't like it doesn't mean it's not part of our food culture. So I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm probably have to get back to you on that. I don't know.